from yesterday with right effort and right thoughts my journey starts afresh though blind passions face me daily I still see Good evening, and welcome to this evening's Bodhi Eve service. I'd like to begin this evening with retelling the story of Buddha's enlightenment. Even as a child, Prince Siddhartha showed great ability in his studies and in practice of martial arts. His father, King Suddhodana, and the people of his country had high hopes for him. One day, Prince Siddhartha noticed a tiny bird pull a worm out of the ground. Soon after, he saw that very bird caught and eaten by a hawk. It is said that with witnessing these events, in which living things can exist only by killing and eating other living things, made a great impression on the young prince. He began to consider deeply the meaning of life. In order to divert his son from such reflection, King Sodadana provided a luxurious castle for him. When Prince Siddhartha came of age, he married the beautiful Yasodhara. However, although the outward aspects of his life were exciting and dynamic, his quest in contemplating the suffering of life continued. The day came when Prince Siddhartha decided to observe the world outside his secluded palace grounds. Leaving the eastern gate of Kapila Castle, he was surprised to see an emaciated old man. Will I become old someday like that man, he wondered. Later, he left the southern gate and saw a man wasted by illness. And when he left the western gate, he caught sight of a funeral procession, leading him to realize that life was just one endless round of birth and death and suffering. Finally, leaving the northern gate, he spotted a monk who had abandoned the ways of the world. He was struck by the noble and dignified attitude of the man. It is said that Prince Siddhartha resolved to become a monk that day. A child was born to Siddhartha and Yasodhara. The prince rejoiced at the birth, but he could not avoid thinking that the child was just another obstacle in his spiritual quest. As a result, the baby was given the name Rahula, which means obstacle. The desire to seek the way continued to grow within Siddhartha. When he was 29 years of age, he gave up the life of a prince 
abandoned his beloved family and sought awakening among those who performed the ascetic practices. His extended family continued to care for his wife and child, a common practice among warrior families. Siddhartha made his way south to a forest next to the capital city of Rajgraha in the country of Magadha. This is the only place in the vast plains of India where there is a mountain range. Raja Graha was located up near the ancient crater where the hustle and bustle of modern development could be sensed. The greatest thinkers of the day were drawn to a place by excitement. Siddhartha made the rounds of these people, questioning them in an attempt to satisfy his search. He soon realized that their answers would not suffice. Determined to seek the truth for himself, he joined a group of five ascetics who lived in the forest next to Uruvila village. He himself was so strict in his practices that he limited his daily food portion to a mere grain of rice. At times he consumed nothing at all. Indeed, he pursued the ascetic path so assiduously, he often lost consciousness and collapsed. It is said that his father, King Sudadana, was once even notified of his death. After six years of this severe lifestyle, both Siddhartha's body and his mind had weakened so much that he realized he would never attain awakening by following such a course. At last, he came down the mountain, washed himself in the Naranjana River, and gratefully accepted milk porridge offered to him by Sujata, the daughter of the village elder. After regaining his health and courage to continue his search, Siddhartha sat down under the large Bodhi tree on the outskirts of the town named Gaya. He vowed not to rise until he had attained awakening and entered into a meditative state. The five ascetics with whom Siddhartha had been performing austerities saw all of this, declaring that he had become a degenerate monk. They abandoned him. As Siddhartha's attainment of Buddhahood drew near, King Mara appeared and threatened him with a flaming sword. Since this did not deter Siddhartha, King Mara transformed himself into a voluptuous woman and sought to seduce him from seeking the way. Siddhartha successfully overcame both the external threat and the internal seduction of his base passions. And so at the flickering of the early morning star on the eighth day of the 12th month, Siddhartha was released from the unawareness and cause of agony over old age, illness, and death. He had become awakened to the way of absolute truth. Siddhartha was 35 years of age. Siddhartha, when Siddhartha was 35 years of age, from that time on, he was referred to as Shakyamuni Buddha. Shakyamuni is a name that means sage of the Shakya clan, and Buddha is a title that means awakened one. In his later years, Shakyamuni Buddha was quoted as saying, we are not noble because of the family into which we are born. Rather, we become noble as a result of our actions. We honor Shakyamuni Buddha today because of his awakening and his compassionate and deeply wise actions that flowed from it. Namo Amidabits. Namo Amidabits. Namo Amidabits. Namanda, 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 Namanda. We will now have sutra chanting, beginning with the Sambujo and followed by Jusege, being led by Reverend Henry Adams. Namanda, but in 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 Namanda.
Thank you, Sensei. Now I'd like to invite Reverend Henry Adams to um, present our Dharma talk. Thank you. Namanda, but Namanda, but Namanda, but Namanda, but Namanda, but Namanda, 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 I'll begin my talk with a verse from the Jusege, which we just chanted, the words of Shakyamuni Buddha. I will be the great provider throughout innumerable kalpas. Should I fail to save all in need, I would never attain enlightenment. Gao muryoko fui dai seshu fusai shobingu se fujo shogaku. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Thanks to all who are here uh, together uh, with us here in the Hondo, and a deep gratitude to all who are uh, joining us on Zoom as well for this uh, very special uh, continuation of our BCSF. Uh, tradition um, where it's uh, wonderful to be together in this way although we can't be uh, we're not all gathered here in person uh, it's wonderful that we're able to connect uh, in this way to reflect upon uh, the Buddha and Shakyamuni Buddha's awakening and to uh, think about uh, how the light of his wisdom uh, shines in our lives today so I'm particularly grateful to uh, Leo Sensei for reading uh, and sharing the story of the Buddha's enlightenment. And I want to kind of uh, zoom in on one of the episodes uh, from that uh, story that he shared. And this is the, the point at which the Buddha is uh, seated uh, before he's become the Buddha. Siddhartha is uh, seated beneath the Bodhi tree. Uh, he has uh, received the generous uh, dana, the, the gift of uh, milk from Sujata. He's now entering into his path and he's uh, become so close to enlightenment that it's said that a bright light has begun to shine from where he's seated. Just like as we can see here, uh, we have these beautiful uh, bright lights uh, illuminating our Bodhi tree here in the BCSF Hondo. And you can see, perhaps you can see, uh, Siddhartha is seated there beneath the Bodhi tree and can you see what he's doing with his hand? Can you see he's got one hand is in his lap and the other hand is reaching down and touching the ground. And so I want to talk about why is it that he has one hand reaching down to touch the ground? So at that moment as that bright line, light was shining forth from the Bodhi tree there was somebody who noticed who noticed that light and who became very concerned and that was Mara. Have you heard of Mara before? Mara, if you recall the story that Leo Sensei shared, he appeared before the Buddha with a flaming sword, a flaming sword, right? So he wasn't cheering the Buddha on, he was trying to stop him, he was trying to move him from that seat under the Bodhi tree because he knew that if the Buddha became enlightened, if he realized awakening, then 
not only would the Buddha be free, but he would be able to guide all beings to liberation. And Mara, see Mara is the king of this world of confusion, this world of delusion. And he controls everyone's minds, right? With greed, anger, and ignorance. So this is a way that we, we tell the story of Mara and we think about Mara as a way of understanding how uh, the, our greed and our anger and our foolishness, how these things create confusion in our lives. And so these are present, right, in my heart for sure, and they're present in the hearts of any being in this world who's not yet enlightened, right? And so I want to say a little bit about Mara and how he's at work in many, the lives of many different beings. In particular, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine who has a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble with Mara. And this is my friend, Mr. Sock Monkey. <laughs> Mr. Sock Monkey has a big problem with Mara because Mara is always playing tricks on him. Always playing tricks on him. And one time, one time, Mara captured this monkey and he locked him in a cage with six windows. There were six windows. And what Mara would do is he would put something that our friend the monkey really liked. He would set a delicious orange in one window. And Mr. Sock Monkey would say, ooh, orange, orange, and he would go rushing over for it, but he couldn't quite reach it. And then Mara would set a delicious banana in another window. And then just as Mr. Monkey thought he could get that orange, ooh, the banana, the banana, and he rushed over here. And then in another window, Mara would put up a, a nice ripe apple. And the monkey would say, oh, apple, apple, I want an apple. He'd go to the apple, and just as he got close to the apple, then Mara would pull down the apple, and Mara would jump up into the window and go, rah, and make a scary face. And poor monkey, oh, he would run and hide. And so Mara, all day long, he would torment poor Mr. Monkey with these six windows. And the monkey would run for one thing he liked, and he would run away from something he disliked. I want this, don't want that, I want this, don't want that. And all day long until finally, ah, oh, Mr. Monkey just collapsed. Collapsed down and he looked up and he saw, oh, wait a second. All above me, the bright blue sky is open, right? Jumped right out the top and ran off, right? Realized his freedom. So these six senses, these six windows, right? These are the ways that we get tricked all day long by six windows in our own body. We have six windows, one that we see out of. Can you guess what that is? Right? Your eyes, right? And then there's one we hear out of, our ears, right? Then one that we smell, our nose, and then something we can taste, right? Our mouth. And then what we can feel. Our whole, our skin is like a window, right? Right now it's nice, comfortable temperature here in the hondo. Very comfortable. Sometimes it can be really cold. Sometimes it can be really hot, right? Maybe if we, uh, if we have maybe an itchy sweater on or something, we might not be very comfortable, right? So our skin is like a window. And then our mind. Right? You can remember something delicious that you had and think, oh, I remember exactly how that tastes. I want to have that again. And then our mind will go for that. Right? And so our minds all day long, they're chasing after things that come in through these six windows until finally, right? finally we, we get exhausted. Right? And we feel really kind of down and tired out. Right? And in those moments, then maybe we might get angry, we might shout at someone, or we might go and grab something we don't really need. Uh, we can cause all kinds of problems by getting uh, led astray by those, those six windows, those six senses. And so Mara, he knew that if Shakyamuni figured out a way to break out of that, if Prince Siddhartha figured out a way to break out of those, those six windows, then he wouldn't be able to control people anymore. And so Mara tried very hard to distract the to distract Siddhartha 
And so he started with that, that window of sight, right? He pulled up this flaming sword, and, right? Chased after him, maybe shouted, made some noise, tried to get him through the ears. But what did Siddhartha do? He just kept sitting. He remained perfectly calm. He couldn't be moved, right? Then Siddhartha, uh, as he sat there, received another attack from Mara. But this one was a little different. This time, instead of trying to chase the Buddha away, he tried to lead him away. So he became a beautiful woman, right? Beautiful person, tried to say, oh, maybe I'd like to go talk to that person. Maybe I'd like to, why don't you come over here? And, you know, why don't we, we have a closer, you know, closer conversation, right? Why don't you come look, look what I have over here, right? Tried to guide him away. He also brought forth delicious food. He created an illusion of delicious food with wonderful smells. Tried to lead the Buddha away. He reminded the Buddha, he said, remember those comfortable beds in your palace? How nice it was? Don't you want to go off into that world and be comfortable? And the whole time the Buddha sat there, very calm. Finally, Mara summoned his whole army all of his scary relatives to come and try to chase the Buddha away. The Buddha remained perfectly calm. Siddhartha remained perfectly calm and said that they started to shoot arrows at him. And as those arrows approached, they became flowers and fell at the feet of Siddhartha. And finally, Siddhartha, undeterred, he reached down and he touched the ground and he claimed that spot. He said, this is where I belong. And the earth shook at that moment to affirm and said, yes, this is Siddhartha's spot. And then at that moment, Mara realized that the Buddha's mind was as calm and settled as the earth itself. He gave up and he went away. So we think about our lives, right? How can we be free from Mara? The Buddha, he realized awakening and he showed us the path to freedom. He showed us the path to be still and to be calm. Now for me, it's very difficult to sit still like the Buddha, constantly running here and there throughout my daily life, chasing after this, running from that. But the Buddha provided me with something that can help me be still, help me be calm, help me settle, let go of my striving and see this open sky up above. And that is Six syllables, a simple phrase, Namo Amida Butsu, the voice of the Buddha calling to me in this moment. Siddhartha became awakened. He came into this world specifically with the purpose of sharing this teaching, this path to liberation for all beings. And I find that path in Namo Amida Butsu. And you can find it too. Whatever you're doing when you find yourself getting carried away by your frustrations or you know, chasing after something that, you know, looks really good or really delicious or really fun and feeling like finding yourself getting pulled way off course. If you're running from something you're afraid of, you can just hear these words, Namo Amida Butsu. Say these words, hear these words, and in that moment, your mind will settle and the light will shine in, the light of awakening that we receive from Amida Buddha in your path to a life of wisdom and compassion will be realized in that very moment. And so Siddhartha, after becoming awakened, after realizing awakening, he shared this teaching that we chant uh, in the Jusege, this vow of Amida Buddha to be uh, the, the one who is uh, able to save all in need. And by realizing awakening, all Buddhas are guiding us on that path. And so this Bodhi Day service is a time to celebrate the awakening of Shakyamuni Buddha, but also to celebrate the fulfillment of our own awakening through the Buddha's wisdom and compassion and the wise teachings that he provides us to be a guide so that we don't get carried away and pulled back and forth, but we're able to remain calm and settled, just like Siddhartha, calm and settled in Namo Amida Butsu. So I thank you very much for uh, this time that we've been able to spend together this evening. Uh, in conclusion, I invite you to join me in Gusho. Namo Amida Butsu. 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 Namo Amida Butsu.
Nem. Nem. Thank you, Sensei, for that Dharma talk and that reminder. Next, I'd like to invite Reverend Elaine Dahlman to come forward and lead us in a group meditation. Good evening. I love Buddhism because questions are encouraged. And the Buddha began his whole journey by asking two questions. One is, why do we suffer? Why, everything he saw, he, asked, he kept asking himself, why do we suffer? And the second question was, how? How do we stop the suffering? How do we, how do we reduce the suffering? And so we can do the same thing. We can ask the same questions as the Buddha when we're upset, when we're sad, when we're frustrated, when we're really angry. We can ask why. Why am I like this? And then once we've calmed down, uh, we can pause. And like the Buddha, we can investigate. And that's where the next quote, once we figured out the why, we can explore the how. How can I move out of this, the predicament I'm in? How can I find opportunities from this difficult situation? How can I keep myself safe? How can I keep my heart open? How can I get the support that I need regarding what's happening, around what's happening to me? And so that's one of the reasons I, many reasons I love Buddhism is because it encourages us to ask questions. And that's exactly what meditation is. So I'd like to invite everyone to get comfortable uh, close your eyes or lower your eyes to weed out the visual distractions and pick a spot on your body where you could really feel the breath. And we're going to use our breath as just like the Buddha did, actually, to center, calm ourselves. So the breath is free. Everybody has it as long as you're living. Um, so close our eyes. Pick a spot where we can really feel the breath, the mouth, the nostrils, the chest, or the belly. And just follow the breath going in and follow the breath going out. And so we're just following the breath going in and following our breath going out. And as we're doing this, we're lowering our blood pressure. We're reducing, slowing down our heart rate. And we're bringing mental clarity to our environment. So like the Buddha, I invite you to go inward when things are difficult or when things are joyful. Pause, take the time and notice and just breathe and ask the questions, why and how, just like the Buddha. So thank you for meditating with me.
Um, I would like to offer appreciations for this evening's service. I would like to thank uh, Reverend um, Adams for leading us in chanting and also for his wonderful Dharma talk. I would like to thank Leo Balambao Sensei uh, for his words of wisdom um, and sharing the, the enlightenment story. I'd like to thank Kevin Yosa for all his uh, technical support. We couldn't do it without him. I would like to thank folks that are here as well as folks that are um, joining us online. Um, now is my one of my favorite um, parts of Bodhi Eve's service is uh, the Gatha with D.I. Lewis and Tony Hale, who come from Berkeley Buddhist Temple, and they've always joined us oh, for many years now um, on our Bodhi Eve service. And so I know Tony is here. Uh, they have a, a special Gatha that uh, they have prepared for us. So Tony, would you mind sharing a couple words, please, about uh, what, what we'll be listening to tonight, please? Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, the honor of being here with you again. Uh, it's always a a joy and and, and uh, quite a special a special time for for us to join you. I'm here on behalf of Di Lewis, uh, who who couldn't uh, make it to tonight. Um, he really is the, the primary guest. I'm the Robin to his Batman. Um, <laughs> but uh, he every year uh, he brings a song to you. And uh, today uh, we'll be sharing with you a song called Today is Today. It is a song that was actually composed back in 2012, almost 10 years ago. Um, I believe he, he actually performed it for uh for you some years back but uh but we made this recording 10 years ago and uh it features uh di on guitar uh lauren bond uh, then known as lauren kagahiro uh on lead vocals accompanied by by me tony hale and uh the, it is a song dedicated to um our then uh, minister, uh, Reverend Dr. David Matsumoto, he had an expression. Um, he would say, uh, does anyone know what today is? Um, and uh, he would then end with it saying that today is today. And it was a affirmation of uh, living in the present, of um, recognizing uh, the need to um, be present, and uh, that uh, today holds uh, abundant possibilities in it. So um, it's, uh, I think it's an appropriate song to share on, on, on Bodhi Day and uh, a, a day of, of awareness and enlightenment. So um, with that, I will go ahead and uh, share my screen. Hopefully the, the music comes through, unless on your end you're prepared to play it, I can, I can play it or, or you can play it. Whichever you can. Uh, Tony, you can go ahead and play it if you'd like. Okay. I will do that. You may see uh, darkness here, but you should hear music. Here we go.
Thank you, Tony DI. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this concludes this this evening's Bodhi Eve service. Thank you all for joining in. Please join me in Nambutsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namanda. 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 Thank you so much.